Um, so we're specifically going to talk today about going on the academic job market for teaching focused positions. A lot of the material here is going to be related even if you want to apply to a research-based position and others, but we're going to talk specifically about how these documents look as an overview for teaching institutions. And this is going to be a holistic overview, not an in-depth examination of the specific documents themselves. I do a series over the summer and fall on the academic job market where I actually devote an hour, hour and a half to going through each one of these documents in these because they actually take a lot of time to say what goes into a proper cover letter. We don't have enough time to go over it, but to give you kind of an overview, um, which is also to say as part of my position as the graduate writing specialist, I meet one-on-one -on -one with students to go over any type of writing in any assignment, any field, any context, from the brainstorming to it is due the next day. This is class writing, your thesis dissertation, but it's also your academic job materials. So I'm happy to work with you one-on-one -on -one. if you ever can't make a session or you want someone to look at your research statement, I do that. All you have to do is send me an email, which you will have because I will send you an email with a PowerPoint. So it comes full circle. Um, so starting with the beginning. Um, the first thing I think you all have to know is where are the jobs? Because this is not something that's necessarily talked about. In general, you should, you'll have a disciplinary website that actually aggregates the jobs at large in your field. So if you are, is, say, in English and the related languages, your jobs are all on MLA. If you are in economics, they'll be posted on Joe. So first thing is you have to actually know what is the hub that concentrates all the job postings because you need to find the job ads in order to read for them correctly and know what you're applying to. Other resources that you might consider are Inside Higher Ed, which is kind of a aggregate host of all types of jobs, mostly with American universities, though it can be outside. There's Times Higher Education, which is the same principle, but does a lot of international universities that inside higher ed doesn't. So if you're looking to work abroad or say in Oceania, Australia, New Zealand, you'll find those there. And then also keep in mind, listservs are really important for specific subfields, particularly if you're also doing university related work, but not on an academic track, so administrative stuff, that usually doesn't get a major job post. It's within specific circles. Or if it's a small university that can't afford to pay the job hosting site, they might distribute amongst the members. So you might want to find out what are the listservs related to your specific fields and get on those because a lot of jobs get passed word of mouth that way. Then you have to learn how to read for the position. And this is an actual sample ad that's on right now. So I want to break this down for you. Um, Assistant Professor of Creative Writing Fiction is the official title. Um, but notice how it changes of what's happening. And this is what I'm highlighting. Assistant Professor of Creative Writing Fiction in the English Department of Allegheny College invites applicants for tenure track position um, in fiction writing target, starting August 2019. The ideal candidate will be an active writer of literary fiction whose work and professional interests intersect with the African diasporic literatures and who will be able to contribute to the college's Black Studies program. Responsibilities include teaching undergraduate courses in fiction writing, introductory literature, and diasporic African literatures. Qualifications are a PhD or advanced ABD, graduate study in creative writing, and a promising record of publication in fiction and college teaching experiences. Strong candidates will demonstrate a commitment to undergraduate education, including pedagogy and experience consistent with diversity, equity, and inclusion. The teaching load is 3-3 with course releases earned for senior project advising. All Allegheny faculty teach in the college-wide first-year sophomore seminars. Now, there's different things that people get drawn to in here. The things I look for in terms of why I'm highlighting is first this, the rank. I'll talk about that in general in a bit, but understand y'all at your career are looking for assistant professor. If this said associate professor or full professor, you cannot apply for that. You are not at that rank, and I'll explain the ranks, but you always check for rank. Then tenure. It is a tenure track position. You, this, we'll go over those in a bit too, but the idea is you want to know possibly 
do you want to apply for non-tenure track lines? There's, I'm not going to get into the politics of the various decisions, but I want you to know to read for it. Just because it says assistant professor does not mean it's a tenure position. If it doesn't say so, that's probably likely that it's not because they will usually put it in, but you can always write for clarification. The reason I highlight African diasporic literatures is just because from the start of creative writing fiction, this is not a singular hire. This is a dual hire where they're tr getting someone in creative writing, but they're also trying to get a specialty in the field, which is why it's with the college's Black Studies program. So understand that the title of the position itself might be misleading in that it's not hiring for one thing. They're basically hiring two or more positions simultaneously to know if you're competitive. Then we see kind of the classes that are being taught. So this is a writing, but also a lit hire position. And there are other important things in terms of qualifications. The reason why I'm not really getting to that is because y'all, I'm assuming, will have a PhD, so you'll meet the academic qualifications for these positions. It's an experienced one. Talking about the publishing record, and uh, this is very specific for this field. Most positions you are applying to will not specify. You must have a book or an article published in Cell. Um, this is just a unique feature to kind of the arts where that's their criteria. Um, so if you were in it, the bigger thing you need to notice, it says 3-3. Three, three. That means this is a teaching heavy position. Basically what this is saying is in a semester, you are expected to teach three classes in fall and in spring. Semester is looked at out of four, quarter is kind of done out of five, sorry, it's the other way, um, some is out of four and quarter is done out of three. So the idea is a three, three is you are teaching three classes and you have one unit reserved for research that time. If this were a quarter system, it could be a four, four, four. I'm sorry, it'd never be that. It would be a 3-3-3. Three, three, three. Traditionally, that would be full teaching load. If this is a 4-4, four, four, that's a full teaching load. Community colleges might get up to five. Um, so this is telling you how many courses you're doing. At a semester, anything more than two is considered teaching heavy. Two is considered research and below. So if it's like a 2-1, they're saying, it's a lot of research, so they're expecting high publications, a lot of research experience, um, or that's what the ideal is going for, that's what the hire is about. It's not to say your publishing record and research isn't important when the numbers are higher on the teaching, but that, that's how you know it's a teaching-focused position in addition to the name that they're getting into. And the fact that they talk about college-wide first-year sophomore third, this is getting into the type of institution and work that they're doing where you can tell it's very teaching-oriented because they're starting at the ground level. It's not this advanced graduate program. And this is how the ad continues, where you can read a little bit more about what's going on with the ethos of the university. Allegheny College is a highly selective private liberal arts college in Northwest Pennsylvania with an increasingly diverse student body. Um, you can read through, I'm not going to go through all of these. Um, th in the next paragraph, it says, please submit a letter of application. That's a CV, diversity statement, email it to whom. The reason I'm focusing on these specific things is first, this is a private liberal arts college meaning it has a very specific function in terms of it's a smaller uh, pool, private universities versus research, and we'll talk about that in a sec. So understanding what is the demographic of the students and the type of education they're looking for. These tend to be teaching heavy um, in this regard with often sometimes like superstar researchers who are doing the teaching. Increasingly diverse student body and the fact that I'm pointing out to they look at challenges, racism, sexism, heterosexism, religious bigotry, and then knowing how they define certain characteristics such as women, racial and ethnic minorities, members of the group. This is not to say you cannot apply for this position if you identify as, say, a white male, but it's important in noting that this is a very progressive 
campus and probably job hire, but the fact that they even say gender, gender identity, and gender expression are all protected, and that they know to differentiate between them. This is important if you're particularly looking to see how your identity might be embraced at a particular institution. I mentioned this as a person who openly identifies as queer, and I'd say about a tenth of the jobs that I applied to um, were available at Christian universities. And that was something I had to like figure out was, was I welcome here? And that was one of the things I looked at was what was their diversity and inclusion statement? And did it include protections for various things? So I point this out because depending on your identity and wanting to know where you might feel comfortable, this is one of the starting places where you can see of whether you even want to consider a position or not. Other things getting more to the nuts and bolts, when it says letter of application, that's a fancy way of saying cover letter. You will probably always have one of those, your CV and a diversity statement. Um, they're nice here. They actually spell out what they're doing, and I'll talk a little bit more about those documents. They're not actually asking for a teaching philosophy here. Some will, some won't. Notice that this is done by directly emailing the chair. Um, and then, and very commonly now, as you advance, essentially, if you're asked to be an interview, then you send samples and letters of rec because they don't want to have to weigh that from every applicant that they're not actually strongly considering. So some will ask for all these documents up front, some won't. But always figure out how you apply. Some will request that you apply directly through Interfolio. A lot of them have the applications right through the, the university website. So you can find out all this information. And then it, when it says, review will begin immediately with full considerations given by March 1st, this is a fancy way of saying that they're looking right away. And as long as you get your application in by this date, they will definitely consider. They will read applications still after that date theoretically, if they don't have enough applicants that they want. So my rule of thumb, particularly when you start going on the market and there's a lot of jobs to consider, you need to organize things based off when this date is. Is when is the latest you can get things in and still be considered? Because you kind of have to triage when is the thing you must get in because there might be 10 of them you're working on. And they're not going to be all at the same time, perhaps. So this is how you read time. After that, you're taking a roll of your dice, and particularly people who are really well qualified, they'll throw their hat in the ring very soon, and you don't want to like hope there just aren't enough great applicants yet. So this is just kind of reading for the position of ways that you really need to comb the address, uh, the job site, but also because this tells you a bit about the school and what they want so that you can write about it in your cover letter as well, identifying that it's liberal, that they're embracing issues of diversity, that it should be included in the classroom and the teaching for this position. If you fail to talk about those in all your statements, you're not actually giving them the materials they're looking for for this hire. So the flavor of these jobs are usually contained as well. This is, again, a little more on the humanities side. If you're in, say, engineering, you might find none of this language in there, where they're saying, we want someone who can teach you know, molecular constructions of these polymers. Um, don't have to get much more detail than that. So knowing the terms. So the first things in terms of the positions, we have instructor, lecturer, professor, and postdoc. And structure is what we colloquially call usually adjunct. Again, not getting to the politics of this, but this is someone who teaches coursework typically on a contingent basis, meaning a one to two year contract, sometimes longer, but you don't have guaranteed status and you typically don't have all the benefits that come with being a full-time employer because you might not work at the minimum amount of hours that a university would require in order to provide benefits. And often that is intentional. Um, depends on your field how good they are with it. They also get paid less money than other positions. Moving up the ladder is lecturer. Lecturers have very similar responsibilities to instructors, but they typically have more security, higher pay, and will do certain work within a department. They might serve on search committees as well. They will attend faculty meetings, perhaps, depends on the department. So it's essentially a better paid, better respected position compared to instructor. And these, again, are common as well. 
When you move into professor, the three positions that we typically see are assistant, associate, and full. You begin at assistant. Typically after five-ish years, you go up for tenure review. If you go from there, you get promoted to associate. You go for another review, then you hit full. You get increases of salary and other perks as you go up the chain. Um, and so when you're applying for jobs, most jobs will usually be at the assistant level. This is, but though, keep in mind when it says, sometimes it will say a professor at open rank or assistant or associate. You need to specify that in your cover letter and understand whom you're applying for. The reason I bracketed advanced assistant is sometimes you'll see positions say advanced assistant. This is a fancy way of saying that they're expecting you to go up for 10 year review in about two or three years, which is probably not where you're at. Though if you already are kind of a superstar in your field and you're like, no, I'm having an article come out in science in three months, I will go up for review in three years, then apply for those jobs. But otherwise they say, don't kind of waste your time on an application where even if you theoretically got the job, you would not have the time to make your tenure case because then they're looking for the article in science, the million dollar grant, the book, um, depending on what your field and your conventions are for tenure. And then you have your postdoc positions as well. Now, in terms of duration, we have short-term, non-tenure, and tenure. Um, short-term contracts are, again, can it be anywhere from a year to a few? They'll sometimes specify that, but they'll say like, short-term lecture hire. Again, no judgments of whether you want to go for that, but that's what it typically means. Non-tenure means you could theoretically be like a lecturer and have secure employment. You know, I believe at UCSB a lot of the lecturers actually have five plus years, and they have their own kind of tenure system where after they get reviewed several times at kind of three to five year increments, they actually get very good job security. They don't get the full like pay of a tenured professor, but they're, it's much better than the insecurity out there. So non-tenure is not necessarily a deal breaker for many people, but just knowing what it's there. And then there's the tenure line structure. Kind of euphemisms that you might find, um, visiting term limited teaching professors. Um, visiting kind of used to mean a different thing. Um, it's still, you'll see a lot of ads for visiting professor. It used to be that you had a tenure professor maybe going on maternity leave, going on sabbatical, and they needed to fill the spot briefly. And so, and you were say at University of Santa Barbara and you're like, you know what, I love New England. I want to become a visiting professor at NYU or Harvard just for a year to kind of go there. And so it was kind of this honor where you as a faculty person would kind of just teach at another university for a little bit, and then you come back home. That's still the case, but more and more, these are used to fill positions where they're essentially going for that very short-term position, and they just constantly call it a visiting professor. Now, I will say a lot of people can often get hired in those visiting terms if that position actually opens up because they were the last kind of person in the market. You know all the colleagues, they like you, you worked with them for a year or two. So it can be a promising opportunity. It's not to knock on it, but it's kind of changed what it used to be. Term limited is a fancy way of saying short term. Um, you might see that as a term limited professor, still same deal. And then often now you'll see in certain fields, teaching professor or professor of practice. These can be tenure, they're usually not. This is what's kind of turning into in the field where there's understanding that you can have professors who teach as opposed to research. And so these are professor positions, but function very much to lecturers, but higher pay and recognition. So, Again, they might be tenure, they might not. They have different review criteria specifically related to teaching. But these are what these positions are. You're not expected really to do any research with them. And then in terms of institutions, you have your R1s, which are research-dominated universities like UCSB. You have your SLACs, which are small liberal arts colleges, which by definition are teaching focused. Even if they're hiring you as a researcher, you're going to do a lot of teaching there. And then you have your community colleges, which are teaching focused by default as well. Now, moving into the actual documents in terms of your cover letter, which is kind of the first thing. 
Um, this is typically the introductory document for anything you're going to apply to. It states what you're applying for, the reasons that you're going to do it, and why you think you're great. Essentially, it's the abstract to the job saying, this is why you should consider me. And you know that can be read in a minute or two. Um, it works in conjunctions with the other documents and where essentially you're selectively bragging about all your highlights and context because yes, a point might be in the CV, but it's just a name. It's an award. It doesn't actually use a sentence to explain why it's a big deal. So this is where you talk about your features and why you're a great fit. Um, it also will address those key components. Remember in the job ad, there were very specific signs about what the position is looking for. You want to make sure you talk about those keywords because particularly jobs that kind of go through a computer search, you might end up with a faculty committee first. You might end up first in HR where they just have a computer sort through with an algorithm and say who are the candidates that actually match the position best, which is who will use the keywords from the actual job ad and related words. Um, and then it communicates you've done your homework because you don't want to talk about um, how much you love teaching in intimate environments and the job posting is you're going to teach introductory chemistry to a class of 200. So don't recycle you know, blindly. Now in terms of the style, different rules depending on where you're going and understanding the teaching focus institution looks different than the research one. It will have the same components, but the order of the paragraphs actually change. Um, so in terms of what you're going to do, it needs to be on department letterhead. This is not an argument. You, if you don't already have access to it, ask your graduate advisor if it sends a sign to a committee that you're not professional or that you're not actually graduated from where you're claiming are. So all departmental letterhead, you have a formal address, which is the person you're writing to, the committee, the full uh, date written out. There's, it's a business letterhead. You're going to have an organization of the paragraphs in a particular style. I'll talk about that. 12-point standard font, and it's single-spaced. Um, and two pages max, humanities kind of humanities, social sciences get to go up to two pages. Sciences, engineering are page to page and a half. The further it is, closer it is to engineering and the physical sciences, the more it is that page. The more life science-y it can spill over. UCSB also has a really large drop because of its logo. So if you go over than a page, it's usually OK because you lose about a third of the page just to the university logo. Um, it's, yeah. Um, you'll see it if you haven't already done so. Now, in terms of the content that you put in, um, you're always going to start with the introductory paragraph. And again, in my like cover letter or presentation, I will explain this in great detail. You can also meet me in one-on-one. -on -one. Um, you'll then have a teaching paragraph, a service paragraph, a research paragraph, and a conclusion. Um, say at a research position, research becomes the first paragraph after your introduction. Um, and you can, it's not to say you have these in discrete sections. You know, research usually is two different paragraphs of what your current research is, maybe what your future projects are is a different one. Teaching and service can also expand a little bit about different components. So it's not a five paragraph essay. It's just these are the standard things where you have a kind of an intro, which is a I am applying for this job at this rank. I'm graduating from here. It's a very quick, stylized way where I'm happy to discuss one-on-one -on -one or in my presentation. My tips for this one is remember that it works in concert. Um, you don't want to just kind of repeat everything that's going to be in the dossier. Um, you want to demonstrate that your letter is not a carbon copy. Again, this is why you're supposed to, at the minimum, change the date and the letterhead address the quickest way to have your application rejected is to send an application to a university addressed to the last job you applied to. Or that you haven't changed the date, and so it's three months later. They'll know that. And everyone in the job market likes to feel special, that you are wooing them. Um, so it's little things like that at the minimum. There are other things to do, which you know I t can talk about more later or if you have a question about it. You might be a grad student, but they're hiring assistant professor. This is in general, 
No one's looking to hire a grad student. You cannot sound like a grad student. In any job that you are applying for, you must act and sound like the position that they are hiring for is already there. And I can talk a little bit about that um, in detail if you want to know. But the idea is a lot of people position themselves as, look at my dissertation, my dissertation. And it's like, does your PI drone on and on about his or her dissertation? It's called your research and you refer to it as that because one of those signs of you sound like a grad student is you keep on calling it a dissertation. You will rely on specifics. People say, I love teaching. It's my favorite thing. I love working with students. And like, great, so does the 200 other people who just said that exact same thing. I have no idea what classes you teach, what are your specific methods, and why you're better than everyone else. So moving on to the CV again, these are quick cursory ones. Um, so CVs are really useful, particularly in the STEM fields, because you can screen through hundreds of people just by going to the publication page and being like, nope, that's not what our program wants. Whether that's fair or not, not the question, it's just something a lot of people do. Um, when they're designed really well, it also delivers the information very clearly, and that's the key to a really good CV. There's no, it must look like this, but it must have all the information organized so that people can clearly find it. You don't want to piss off any of your readers searching through your documents because they're reading way too many of these and they're looking for any reason to perhaps cut you. Um, CVs are vital, but again, specifically to any research job, they're very important. And not that, again, it's fair, but it's one way applicants can directly compare, because they can look at a journal name and be like, well, this one has a higher ranking. Um, this person had X many more grants. And keep in mind, it's your oath. Not to say that everything isn't supposed to be true, but when you say, like, I am really passionate about teaching, that's a qualitative statement. It's not like you're going to prove it. But if you say you published in a journal, you better have published in that journal. You can lose your position for faking information. The do's and don'ts about them. Um, it stands for curriculum vitae. It's not a resume. Um, a resume is a, in the United States is a very short one to two page document, um, typically one that selectively highlights your skills. A CV goes on for as long as it needs to. It documents kind of everything. Now keep in mind, in the US, in academic context, we primarily use CVs. If you're applying for jobs uh, in the European Union, Australia, New Zealand, um, Commonwealth, and they, they call what we call a CV, they call that a resume. So do not send a resume to Cambridge when they ask for a resume. They're actually asking for a CV. Um, so little thing to note. Um, the CV is summarizing your relevant career. It is not a biography of everything you've done. You have to edit it out, which is why it's malleable. You don't, it's, it's perfectly fine for you to probably at this point list stuff that you've done as an undergraduate. But unless it's a really prestigious award, let's say you got the NSF GRFP as an undergraduate going into grad school, do you think your professors still talk about their undergraduate careers? to their colleagues. This is what I mean is you don't want to sound like a graduate student talking about what you did in high school. You know? And then it's really the backbone of the application as opposed to just another thing you put in. Everything kind of draws off of the experiences here. Now, in terms of designing it, consider if you're going to use a template or not. There are many out there. Make sure they're professional if you do. You use 12-point font standard for the text, but your headings and subheadings judiciously go up and down in size to emphasize. Standard fonts and characters. Um, you can use bolding, highlighting judiciously very commonly. Let's say you're in STEM and you have articles and you're not the first author in some of them. You always bold your name so they can quickly find where are you placed in that list. Um, refrain from over-designing. This is not a place where you want to show your super creativity. Um, white space is super essential. It should not read like a book. We should clearly have the room to breathe. And length is kind of important. Um, when you're listing things, it goes in reverse chronological order. So like in education, you start with your PhD, then you go to your master's, then you go to your undergraduate. Publication so it's the recent one first and honors. It's not the other way around. You're going to paginate with your name. 
You're going to carve your CV with appropriate headings. I'll talk about that in a sec. Um, it's about three to five pages for a beginning scholar and about seven to ten pages for an assistant professor is typically where they're going. So you want to be weary if your stuff is falling below three pages. This is kind of the standard market. Um, and you can have flair within the boundaries in terms of your design. Now, in terms of content, again, this changes depending on your job and what you emphasize. But for a teaching position, it typically goes a header, which is your contact information, your education, where you went, honors and awards, and grants. The reason grants is separate is because often in STEM, grants is its own section, and that's more important because they want to see how much money you win um, from the NSF. Teaching and mentoring. Um, if you have enough people that you mentor, that can become its own section. Publications and presentations. Um, often presentations, as in talks and conference proceedings, get subset into its own little section. Um, research, and then if you have, is kind of the research projects you've worked on. Again, social sciences, uh, STEM is more prominent, and clearly those go much higher or earlier in a, one of the research fields. Patents, if you have them, go on here too, if you're in kind of any field that does patent work. Service, this is kind of your involvement of committees, reading articles for journals, volunteering experience, there is a section for that. Affiliations is kind of any kind of memberships you belong to. Are you in MLA? Are you in Joe? And then references, some have them, some don't. That one can kind of be extract. And again, I talk about all these in more detail in the actual CV uh, workshop. Now, moving on to the diversity statement. I'm skipping over the research statement because aside from slacks, which even if they're hiring you as teaching, often might want to know about your research, teaching focused positions don't necessarily want a research statement because you're going to be teaching. I do an entire workshop on that, and you can meet with me one on one to talk about it. We're just not going to do it today. But know that I am aware of research statements, and I'm happy to help you with them. The diversity statement is a new one. Um, not everyone has it, but the job I asked you did it. And the reason that they're doing it is because research shows by simply asking for one, um, I think the figure was last time I saw it, about a third of hires increased in diversity in various forms. And so it's leading to a more diverse applicant pool, which then is leading to more hires. So it doesn't mean you get in because you're a diverse applicant. And keep in mind, a diversity statement is not about talking about why you meet diversity personally. A diversity statement is about explaining why diversity is important to what you do. So in terms of your teaching, your research, your working with students, that you are aware of the importance of diversity. So you, if you identify as a heterosexual white male, you are not disenfranchised by it. Rather, what they're asking is, so as a position, person of position, how do you make your research base more inclusive? So if you're in a lab, do you recruit women and underrepresented minorities? And do you make that conscious effort? You can talk about that in your diversity statement. That's what they're looking for. And again, I'll go through a whole specific um, workshop on that. But just as a nutshell, that's what it is. Now, the teaching statement, which I'll talk a little bit more about here because we're talking about teaching jobs. Um, I want to point out you are not special because you have TAs. Who kind of has it for the most part going on the job market? So it's not enough to simply be, I've done this. And your teaching statement, sometimes called your teaching philosophy, um, prioritizes who you are in the classroom. I want to repeat, this is not a philosophy on why you love to teach. I read a lot of teaching statements that basically go on and on about how you love group work and why you think education is so important. That's absolutely not what they're about, and I will not remember this out of the 200 I have to read. Um, the goal is to make you sound as someone who can teach. Essentially, what we're working with here is you're giving a teaching demo on the page where you're not talking about your general ideas of education. You're saying, like, in this specific class, there was this like really interesting pedagogical problem that came about. And this is how I worked through it. And this is why I did it. And this is why I'm really great at my job at teaching. You're actually teaching on the page. The reason it's called a teaching philosophy is because in demonstrating how you teach, we see the philosophical underpinnings that informs your teaching practice. 
Now, in terms of what we do, it you have to pick specific examples. No broadly. You can talk in general about many things, but I want to actually see a specific lesson, a specific text, a specific time in the classroom. You need to frame your pedagogy in terms of realizing, and again, this depends on the field where if you're, say, applying to jobs in education, they might ask you to expect you to talk about zones of proximal development and Vygotsky in theory. Um, as a name drop, not to go in detail about it. Where if you're in you know, engineering, saying you like to do group work might be sufficient pedagogy and explaining an assignment of how you do group work. So keep in mind the field. Um, you want to state your goals and explain how you achieve them. Like very the thing we kind of assume is there, but what are you trying to get out of your students in this particular lesson that you're talking about them? Um, Identify key texts and onwards, so in the sense of what textbooks do you use, or articles did you sign, or books did you have them read, things to challenge them, things that you found problematic, that you revised them. It kind of just depends on the anecdote you're talking about, but don't be a specific. I need to remember your application from 200 and the details of the ways that I do it. You need to talk about your students. A teaching full statement that talks about why you're great in the classroom that never acknowledges the struggles your students maybe encountered before the lesson and how they changed, where you can actually demonstrate why your class benefited from your teaching, isn't successful because I don't know the outcome. So I clearly want to see how the students responded to whatever you're talking about. Um, and often, particularly in jobs that involve some research, talking about how the teaching relates to your research interests can be very important. So for example, do you take what you do in your research field into the classroom and vice versa? Do you recruit from your classrooms and find your mentors in there? This can be really important depending on the field where they want to see, like, not only does this person teach, but this is how this person like identifies promising talent and then brings them into the field and helps professionalize them. So making sure you make those connections are vital. And you have two kind of versions of this in length, um, a one page and a two page. You can assume that if they're not asking for a page limit, you can kind of go up to two pages, single spaced. Um, some will specifically come out with a, we want a one page version. The difference is the two page version just kind of goes into more detail unpacking what's going on. In general, um, for say, again, CV can go up to many pages. The diversity statement, same rule of thumb, one to two pages, shorter side towards research, engineering, longer-ish on the humanities, but never more than two pages. And we're talking about single space, 12 point font. So yeah, that's kind of my spiel of just as an overview. <laughs> um, but I'll take your questions now, specifically if there are things you want to unpack. Thank you so much, Re yeah. really informative. Um, you had a, just, this is just a brief comment, you had yeah. a list of the different hierarchy of institutions like R1, mm -hmm. the liberal arts colleges. Where would you assign, say, the CSU system? Um, those are actually usually teaching heavy. Um, so R1 is an actual official like designation in which they get. And it's not to say CSUs don't do research. It has to do with the facilities and kind of the focus at large. And uh, speaking from what UCSB is actually engaging in at the moment, there's one of their pedagogical processes projects right now with the NSF is actually to prepare students for teaching at CSUs because they're finding many alumni of the university who go on to teach at CSUs find this actual roadblock they hit where they're not actually prepared because they're great scholars, but they haven't done the necessary teaching yet. And it's a very different environment teaching in a CSU versus UCSB because Class sizes are different, different student populations and expectations. So um, CSUs typically, depending on the position, but overall, that is a teaching heavy institution. Yes. Um, uh, thanks, that was really helpful. Um, in terms of 
not marketing yourself as a graduate student when you're applying for these positions, mm -hmm. how would you talk about your teaching experience if um, a lot of your development has been as a TA? Mm -hmm. I've been so, advised to not say that I TA a course, but then my advisor mm -hmm. has also said that makes it sound like you are instructor of record, which is mm -hmm. false advertising. Yeah. What classes were you, because it, it helps also to give a discipline specific answer. Um, uh, upper division field course in aquatic biology. Okay, so in general, in the sciences and anyone in the research field, no, it's really hard to be an instructor of record. It's not similar to humanities where that's common. They kind of know that, but one of the things that's also hard is in a lot of the field is you're probably going to have to get a postdoc or two, not always, but that's different than the humanities are changing too now in a little bit in that way. But one of the things I'd recommend is focus on what you do in say your lab or section that's really different from others. For example, what assignments did you design? How did you prepare students for the quizzes and tests? Um, did you give specific readings? The little things that everyone has the room to negotiate within those positions. So you talk about and say, so when I was, you know, uh, teaching my section of, you know, field research methodology, I noticed that my students consistently struggled with this. So I devised this, you know, framework. That's what I would want to see in the teaching statement where you're not calling yourself a TA. You're just identifying as an educator, like in this context for this class, my students struggle. And this is what I did to do it without referring to labels. Does that make sense? Yeah. And then on the CV, you list um, a common term can be, it's either depending on your position, TA, if you're actually assistant or lab assistant, um, or sometimes uh, graduate student instructor. Uh, depending on your position. Other questions, yeah. Thanks, Robbie. Under the cover letter section, you mentioned that we should have a formal address, mm -hmm. business letterhead format. Where should we look for samples of what that would look like? Um, I mean, I can send you all samples of any of these statements as well. Part of when you come to my workshops are I have them on file, but I also distribute multiple samples depending on the discipline you're in. So you can see what a sample looks like in your field for a cover letter or a research statement or a CV. Um, so I'm happy to do it. But in general, it's not scary. Um, the business address is essentially usually about four lines where you start off with usually the person who's chairing the committee, if you know that person's name. You then write the address of the institution or more usually the department of where that committee chair is housed. You write out the full date as a name. So if I were to say like April 26th, I would actually write out April 26, 2019. And I was like, dear Dr. So-and-so and members of the search committee. And I'll have all of that before I actually begin, you know, I am writing to apply for the X position at the rank of assistant professor. I am currently a graduate student at the University of Santa Barbara. Oh, sorry, I say I am currently a doctoral student or um, I am set to graduate in June. There's kind of different ways to do it, but you have to essentially identify in that intro paragraph. I'm applying for this job at the very first sentence. Don't think of it as redundant because there are maybe multiple search committees in a department and you might get into the wrong pool, but particularly if it's open rank, they need to know what level you're applying. You move right into this is where I'm coming from. This is where my degree is. And particularly for those who in your status, it's less a concern afterwards, but you have to state when you are going to defend if you have not already defended and you make that clear that you have defended or with an anticipated defense date of blah. Because the thing is, while some will hire an ABD, most positions will revoke your offer if you do not have the PhD in hand by that start date, which is why you always want to keep in mind when things are supposed to start. So you tell them, I am slated to defend by this. And that's one of the things they just confirm with your recommenders. Um, behind the scenes usually. Is this person actually going to defend on track? Yes. Um, and then from there in that kind of intro paragraph, you basically say, I am writing for this job because of my excellence in like these specific fields. It's a very quick, short thing. And that's kind of what we mean by the business address and intro. But again, I can show you specific examples of that. 
Yes. So as a graduate student in the, in the STEM fields, I know I, I should probably do a postdoc before I mm -hmm. apply for assistant professorship. Um, should I, I mean, so most of these things you're referring to are for grad students, but would I be doing this as, as a postdoc, I guess? Would I be using my postdoc institution's cover letter? Or? Yes, um, you should be doing it. And it's also the question of, let's say you go into a job like industry where you're just like, you know, I want to work for five years and then you want to go to academia. You can theoretically, it's kind of a rule of thumb of how far you've been distanced from the institution. Within kind of two to five years, you can still use the previous letterhead. If you're at kind of a job that's you actually use their letterhead to apply, that's less of a thing in you know a lot of fields like engineering where, oh yeah, we have a lot of industry people come back. Um, if you're kind of very far removed and not affiliated with the place, the kind of ver answer is you use a very formal, nice letterhead that's created. Like it shouldn't just be blank white space. Um, um, but um, with a postdoc, you would use the postdoc's institution because you were affiliated with them. And same as if, let's say, you were an assistant professor that wanted to make a lateral move or apply for another place, you would use your current job's position at that school. So it's always where you're currently at. Um, what about the ESCII scores or ESCII score summary? Does that come up in job applications or is that further down the line? Is that included? Do you talk some about that in like a teaching statement or how, how is that incorporated? I'm not familiar with this score. Oh, there's like the student review. Oh, student, sorry, sorry. Um, just come student email. Um, depending on the job and the committee, this can come about in a few different ways. Some will ask for student eval scores to be sent to them as just an opening thing. Others, which I don't talk about here, but you'll commonly see in a lot of teaching jobs, might ask for what we call a teaching portfolio. It is typically a 10 to 20 page document that includes many things and, you know, one of them are, one of them is a sample range of student evals. So it can come up in different ways. Often it usually is a supplementary thing that when you're invited for an interview, they'll say, we would like you to also send X, Y, and Z, and those are often ones requested for teaching positions. You can mention them in terms of the cover letter or the teaching statement as appropriate. It's saying, you know, for the five years I've taught this class, I had you know, the highest ranked student evaluation or the top 10% and awarded my university's, you know, best X award for teaching. So you can find places to drop them in. It's not necessarily expected you talk about them. You have to find a way to mention them. Does that make sense? Yeah, um, and if it's, they just want you to send like a, just the numbers, um, is there, a way to sort of like put them in context. I just had this one weird situation where I was like, it was the first time I ever TA'd and I was like a 25% TA that was really a grader and none of the students knew me and they still handed out all the mm -hmm. reviews and the students were like, who is this person? We've never, yeah. we don't know. So it's in mm -hmm. there in my official, mm -hmm. It just stresses me out because it's like terrible. Yeah, so I never personally applied for a job that said send us everything you've ever done. Okay. Usually it's kind of you can curate. What they want to see is actually your most recent stuff. Mm -hmm. If everything is really old, that looks really odd to them. So if you send them a couple, um, at the same time, they might specify for the entire thing, but many committees don't want to read through the many, many pages, and what they want are the actual tabled summaries, which is what you particularly do in a teaching portfolio, where you kind of create a table of like, this was the question asked, and then here's the average for the five years I've taught, or like by at least quarter of similar things, and I can show you examples of it, but essentially you condense it, and you selectively put the ones for it that you want. They don't want to go through years and years and years, particularly because assistant professors also apply for these jobs. Um, they have so many years behind them. They're not going to wait through that, typically. Uh, perhaps could you also talk about the usefulness of a sample syllabus? 
yes. process? Yes. So um, in terms of the syllabi, that's another document they might ask for, either with a, we want to see a sample syllabus or two, or if they ever ask for a teaching portfolio, that's one of those things that definitely gets included into the portfolio itself. The sample syllabus should illustrate how you teach. Now, this can be two different things. It can be what you have taught. And particularly if they're asking for more than one, you might confirm they might want to see, because if they know you're a graduate student in a field where you haven't gotten the chance to design your own class, you've supported it. They might also let you submit a syllabus you have designed that you will teach. And some positions, particularly teaching focused postdocs that require um, you to teach it some way, will ask for a syllabus of the course you plan on teaching or possibly could teach. In that, they're looking for you to clearly have stated goals that ask, like, what is this class actually about? Why does it matter? That you have the right texts on there. So the idea is if you're going to teach on a subject, do you, have you curated from the appropriate text in terms of these are the ones we would expect to teach this class, but also perhaps depending on the field, again, this is a little more social science humanities, is there diversity in the range of text that you selected uh, in the sense of is there only one text written by a female out of a list of 10 books you're having your class read? That's something the committee might pick up in a humanities department. Uh, looking at also other forms of diversity in there. Having very clear dates on the assignment, policies for the classroom, things that we kind of take as like, oh, I guess that should be in there because of course it's there. They're actually looking, can you think about the teaching? A calendar that clearly lays out when each assignment is due and how the course is there. Because it's really different having this really wonderful conception of a class and then actually seeing it on how it would be taught because there can be a mismatch where if I'm looking at the syllabus, I'm like, this is way too much work for students. There's no way they can do all the reading and then take these quizzes. This person hasn't really experienced this yet. So you can come off as green in these syllabi. So pay attention to all the nuts and bolts that make for teaching to be smooth. Sorry, they're com competing with something outside. Um, <laughs> where it really illustrates to the committee that you've thought from a student perspective. And that's the best way I can say is first approach it from kind of the teacher's perspective of, so what would other educators be really mindful of, you know, if we wanted our students to know these concepts and why it's important how we connect with someone cerebrally. And then think of the student who is most likely to not do what you want to do because you didn't spell it out. And what would you have to put on the syllabus for him or her to know what you want? Because you're balancing both of those halves, that they see that you're really intelligent and creative, but you know the nuts and bolts of teaching. I'm sorry, we're going to have to take a five-minute break. Yep. Uh, so please thank Robbie for coming in today.